Riley. No, Riley. Welcome not. to the Alabama Archives Book Talk and Signing for Wings of Denial, the Alabama Air National Guard's covert role at the Bay of Pigs. A few announcements. We invite you to pl plan on joining us on Thursday of this week, April 21st, for the Architrix discussion to Kill a Mockingbird, Successes and Myths by Nancy Anderson. And on May 5th, we will be host a Becoming Alabama event. William Davis will present A Government of Our Own, The Making of the Confederacy, co-sponsored by the First White House of the Confederacy. Also, if you would like notices of the different events that we have going on here at the Archives, please sign up with your email address and your home mailing address in the hallway, there's a little sign-up sheet, and we send notices once a month and then two days prior to our different events that we have here. Before the program begins, please remember to silence or turn off your cell phones. Thanks. We welcome today's speakers back to the archives. Governor John Patterson and Warren Tress have been here for several presentations. Today, Mr. Tress will show images and discuss the book which has been re-released by New South Books, and Governor Patterson <coughs> will give additional comments. After the program, both will be here for question and answers and then uh, to sign your book. So we will have about a 10, 15 minute question and answers, and then they will be here to sign books if you have purchased a book from New South Books, which is in the lobby. Now to discuss the Bay of Pigs invasion that took place on this day 50 years ago, please welcome or in trip. I just noticed sitting in the audience that that picture of uh, something has spl uh, splattered on uh, Colonel Joe Shannon's uniform. Now I guarantee you it's on the picture, it's not on his uniform for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, as you know, our talk today uh, observes a tragic and heroic moment in Alabama Air National Guard history. On this day in uh, 1961, eight Alabama Guardsmen braved the deadly skies over the Bay of Pigs in a desperate attempt to turn the tide and save an embattled brigade of Cuban exiles. Only four of the intrepid airmen came back alive. For decades, these airmen were unsung heroes of the Cold War. When Don Dodd and I wrote Wings of Denial in 2001, there were any number of good books. There were the, the library shelves were just full of them, actually, that had been done on the Bay of Pigs. But the Alabama Guard's role for the most part anyway, had been relegated to the footnotes. There had very, been very little done on it. And a large part of the reason for that is they had, they were sworn to secrecy and they kept, uh, they kept that pledge. But, but getting the guard's story told, uh, that's why Randall Williams at New South Books encouraged us to write Wings of Denial, and that's why uh, Don Dodd and I wanted to do it. New South Books, as you know, has reissued the small volume in time for the 50th anniversary. Now, my presentation today basically lays out the military side of this thing. I'm a military historian, uh, I've been told. Uh, former Governor Patterson, who is shown in this picture, this 50-year-old picture, that's uh, <laughs> kind of... <laughs> Who was he was Alabama's head of state at the time, and uh, Alabama's youngest head of state, youngest elected head of state, will then give us a view from the top, his insights into the story. Governor Patterson is shown here, as, as, as I said, with the Air Guard commander, Major General Reed Doster in the middle, and he was known as Papa Doster to his troops, and Colonel Joe Shannon, a dauntless guard pilot, who had flown P-38s in World War II. The Alabama Guard's role in the drama evolved out of a meeting Governor Patterson had with a visitor from CIA headquarters in the early fall of 1960. 
General Doster drove the visiting fireman down from Birmingham. Now, Governor Patterson, as I said, will share more details about this meeting, but essentially he was clued in on a top-secret plan to topple Fidel Castro's, intended to topple Fidel Castro's Marxist regime in Cuba. The CIA wanted his permission for Alabama Guard volunteers to support the plan. The governor was told that the CIA and, and, along with exiled Cuban leaders, had put together a brigade of 1,400, uh, 1, approximately, displaced Cubans from the Miami area. It was not known as Little Havana at that point, to liberate their homeland. The brigade at that time was encamped at a secret training base on a uh, coffee plantation in Guatemala. To provide air support, the CIA had borrowed 16 B-26 light bombers from the boneyard at Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Arizona. And this shows one of the boneyard planes. The agency wanted to recruit guard volunteers from the 117th Tactical Reconnaissance Wing in Birmingham to go to Guatemala and train the exile brigade pilots and air crews. The 117th Recce Wing was ideal for this assignment because it was the last unit to fly B-26s before the Air Force retired these old planes in 1957. This is the recce version of the B-26 flown previously by the Alabama Guard. The B-26 was picked for the covert operation, not because it was ideal for the mission, but like everything else about it, it was picked because it was the primary bomber flown by Castro's Air Force. The CIA planned to paint the bottom of the planes with Cuban insignia to give the appearance of an internal uprising. Needless to say, this deception fooled no one, certainly not Castro or the American press. The American press was all over it, and Castro had spies, uh, I think, even in the brigade. The uh, Governor Patterson received assurances from the CIA that guardsmen volunteering for this mission would not take part or actually fly in combat or be put in harm's way. Now, this is General Doster, again, in, uh, in the cockpit of a B-26. And with his boss's blessing, Doster returned to Birmingham and recruited 80 or so volunteers, most of them from the 117th Wing and Hughes Aircraft. A dozen or so were from the 187th Recce, group here in, at Montgomery's uh, Danley Field. The Guard volunteers were sworn to secrecy and told no one about the mission. But word leaked out anyway. It seems like it always does. Newsmen were all over the story. The Birmingham News ran this picture of the off-duty guardsmen <laughs> letting their hair down before they left for Guatemala. Seated second from uh, the left was Major Riley Schamberger. That's right here. And the reason I point uh, Riley Schamberger out, he was really a great guy and a, a charismatic leader uh, who figures prominently in our story. Governor Patterson knew uh, Riley and, uh, and Joe Shannon very well and can personally relate to these two outstanding officers. A Birmingham News reporter Joe Langford at the time described the Guard volunteers as, quote, mostly laid-back, beer-drinking sons of Dixie, led by a bullish general who called them his little airmen and who was ready to kick Castro's tail. Langford wrote, quote, the rumor mill was working overtime at the airport inn, the beer and barbecue joint near the Birmingham airport, where Hayes technicians and air guardsmen usually ended their flights. Regulars at the bar were conspicuously absent, however, and people were starting to ask questions. Most figured Papadosta was up to something, and soon there was talk of an operation down south. The volunteers wore civilian clothes and were given cover stories and false IDs to mask their real identities. In Guatemala, they went to work 24-7, training the pilots and air crews. Some flew cargo missions in support of the operation. 
This is the B-26 painted with Cuban colors. How well they, did uh, the Air Guardsmen do their job in Guatemala? A senior Air Force officer assigned to the CIA reported on the eve of the invasion that the Cuban brigade pilots and crews that the Guardsmen had trained were, quote, equal to the best USAF squadron, unquote. And I'm sure you'll agree with me is you don't get any better than that. The CIA moved the brigade and its air arm to the other side of the mountains to launch the invasion. The staging base was Puerto Cabezas, a jungle airstrip on the northeast coast of Nicaragua. When Nicaraguan strongman Antonio Somoza let the CIA use the base, he knew they were going after Castro. He prophetically warned, if you don't get the SOB, you will live with him for the rest of your life. Another B-26. I just, I guess I put that one in there to make sure everybody's paying attention. I, uh, the B-26 was a good attack aircraft in its day. Air commandos, our air commandos later flew a variant model, the A-26, against the Ho Chi Minh Trail in, in Laos. But the durable twin-engine bomber was old, and it had no air-to-air -air capability. Without fighter escort, these bombers were sitting ducks for enemy fighters. Now, those flown at the Bay of Pigs were even more vulnerable. The gun turrets were replaced with fuel tanks so the planes would have enough fuel to make the six-hour round-trip flight and still have 30 minutes or so in the target area. And this shows uh, they had to move over from, from Guatemala because the mountains that they couldn't fly over to, to, and still make it up there. They had to move over to... Uh, to the coast. Uh, aircraft, as many of you know, use up more fuel in combat than under normal conditions. They're diving, climbing, jinking, and expending ordnance. Even with added fuel, the brigade bombers were cutting it close. Castro's fighters had the tactical advantage. They could, be, uh, could rise to attack the uh, first wave of bombers and then land at their home bases, refuel, rearm, and return to the skies to challenge the next wave of bombers. So this made it imperative that the B-26s destroy all of Castro's fighters with sustained strikes against Cuban airfields before the Liberation Brigade hit the beaches on 17 April. And if it didn't, the whole thing was in for real trouble. Now, this is basic stuff to airmen. Uh, you're not going to get it all on the first strike. And you've got to go back with recce and follow-up strikes until you finish the job. The CIA uh, had looked into using P-51 Mustangs as escort fighters, but the Mustangs' limited range precluded its use. Modern jet fighters were not authorized because they would, that would wave a red flag that it was an American-backed operation. Florida bases were in range, and aircraft carrier Essex was steaming in international waters off Cuba. But the CIA was under strict orders that no strikes would be launched from U.S. soil, and no U.S. forces would participate in the invasion, period. President Kennedy was not comfortable with the plan. He had inherited it from the Eisenhower administration when he took office in January 1961. Conflicting views from his advisors, added to the uncertainty. Marine Corps Commandant General Dave Shoup warned that the plan was just too risky. 1,400 men may sound like a bunch, but a force of that size, when you think about it, wouldn't even fill the end zone seating down here at Crampton Bowl. This wasn't a guerrilla force. They were poised to make a World War II-style amphibious landing with no naval or heavy artillery fire and woefully inadequate air support. The planned success lived or died on the presumption of a popular uprising against Castro, a long shot any way you looked at it. Now, General Shoup's dissenting voice, unfortunately, either went unheeded or was buried under the JCS consensus papers reaching the president's desk. 
But anyway, that word did not get to the president. As D-Day approached, the invasion plans were tweaked constantly. The president slipped the invasion date twice to make the operation less noisy. He changed the landing from the heavily populated Trinidad area, where the brigade had counted on local support and could escape to the Escambray Mountains if anything went, went wrong, to the Bay of Pigs, which was a god-awful place surrounded by swamps with no escape route. This shows the Bay of Pigs uh, a little closer. The thing that burns me up about at this point about all of this is Richard Bissell, who was the uh, head man in charge of this thing at the CIA, he was the chief of plans. Uh, in my uh, feeling anyway, he was either incompetent and he didn't uh, know what all these military actions meant to this plan that he, uh, that he was in charge of, or he was derelict in his duty because he did not protest to the president. He didn't object and say, hey, this is what it's going to do to our operation. He just quietly accepted the president's changes or the White House's changes that the president ordered him to do and, and then passed them on. The final blow came when the House, White House slashed plans for sustained strikes to knock out Castro's Air Force. In the pre-dawn hours of 15 April, or the early dark hours, the B-26s were on the runway at Puerto Cabezas with their engines running when orders came down that the President had reduced the strike force from 16 to 8 planes to keep the raid from being so blatantly American. All follow-up strikes against the airfields were canceled. General Doster was on the flight line to see the pilots off. He slammed his cap to the tarmac and swore mightily. He knew the B-26 pilots and the small landing force setting sail from Nicaragua on a rust bucket fleet had been dealt a crippling blow. A handful of Castro's fighters, British-made Sea Fury, Fury prop aircraft and armed T-33 jet trainers, survived the scaled-back attacks, and they were on alert when the brigade landed at the Bay of Pigs in the pre-dawn hours of 17 April. Before the day was over, the fighters shot down five B-26s and sank two brigade ships loaded with ammo and supplies. The remaining ships pulled back to the safety of international waters, leaving the landing forces stranded with no means of resupply. The brigade put up a valiant fight, but was too heavily outnumbered and outgunned and out of ammunition on the second day. April the 18th. The survivors were described as client clinging like crabs to a tiny patch of Cuban shoreline, and the air crews had been flying around the clock and were exhausted, the Cuban exile air crews. A few insisted on flying anyway. This is a picture of Joe Shannon's plane, and uh, Riley Schamberger was flying wing and, and this one. It's a painting. In a last-ditch effort, the CIA, CIA got approval for Americans to fly combat missions on 19 April, and they asked for volunteers. Eight Alabamians stepped forward, four pilots and four crewmen. They flew into combat on the 19th in a desperate attempt to save the invasion force. The lead formation was commanded by Billy Dodo Godwin, a major in the Alabama Guard, and Gonzola Herrera, a fearless Cuban pilot known as El Tigre. The other Alabama guard pilots were Joe Shannon, Riley Schamberger, and Thomas Willard Pete Ray, all air guardsmen from the 17th Recce Wing. Their crewmen were Leo Francis Baker, Wade Gray, Nick, so Nick Sodano, all from the guard, and then James Vaughn, who was an Alabamian but worked for the CIA. Godwin and Herrera delivered their ordnance and returned safely to Puerto Cabezas, and Castro's fighters had been alerted, and they ambushed the other B-26s. 
As I said, this is a painting of Joe Shannon's plane and flying nearby his wingman, Riley Schamberger. They made firing passes near the beachhead and had pulled out over, over the, uh, the bay, the bay of, at the Bay of Pigs. When Shannon heard Riley say, I'm hit, he then saw Riley's plane plunge into the water off the Bay of Pigs. The bodies of Schamberger and his crewman, Wade Gray, were not recovered. This is a picture of Wade Gray. This is, this is Riley Schamberger. When his plane went down, the Cuban jet turned its guns on Joe Shannon. Joe Shannon's fighter pilot instincts let him evade the attack by going low at full throttle, hugging the water, and heading directly into the sun to blind his attacker. This is Nick Sedano, who was Shannon's crewman. By evading the, uh, the Cuban jet, Shannon turned the bomber toward home, and they were running on fumes when he and uh, Sedano touched down at Puerto Cabezas. Upon landing, they learned that another B-26 B with two Alabama guardsmen had been shot down while making a strafing run near Castro's field headquarters. This second down bomber was piloted by Captain Thomas Pete Ray. With Pete was Leo Baker, shown in this next picture. Pete Ray and Leo Baker survived the crash, crash landing, only to be shot at close range and killed by Castro's troops. A triumphant Fidel Castro is shown inspecting the downed B-26. His government later reported that Leo Baker's body was buried in a mass grave with those of Cuban exiles who had been killed in the invasion. Baker had Latin features and was mistaken as a Cuban exile. But in one of the more bizarre acts of a long and bizarre career, Castro kept Pete Ray's body frozen in a morgue in Havana for nearly two decades, 18 years, as a war trophy and proof that the U.S. government was behind the invasion. Pete Ray's daughter, Janet, who was six years old at the time that her father was killed, grew up to learn that an American's body, thought to be her father's, was preserved in Havana. She pestered the bureaucracy until arrangements were made to bring her father home. And in December 1979, Pete Ray was finally given a proper burial, and he was laid to rest on a hillside in Birmingham. The CIA presented Pete Ray's family posthumously with a medal for bravery, shown here on display at the Southern Museum of Flight in Birmingham. The government remained silent, however, that Ray and the other guard heroes were at the Bay of Pigs. They were more or less painted as mercenaries. Four decades after the failed invasion, the CIA broke its silence and acknowledged that the slain guardsmen had died in service to their country. They were given special recognition in the Hall of Honor at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. In 2001, the CIA honored the surviving uh, Guard members who flew at the Bay of Pigs. Joe Shannon and Nick Sedano were awarded special CIA medals at a ceremony in Birmingham. Medals for bravery were also given to the families of Billy Godwin, James Bond, and Dalton Livingston, who were deceased. Livingston, who had not been mentioned previously, had flown an earlier secret mission at the Bay of Pigs. He joined the CIA after the failed invasion and was killed later in a crash in 1975. This is the Bay of Pigs Memorial in a Little Havana. The Alabama Guardsmen remained close to the Cuban freedom fighters they trained and flew with, and the group was photographed a few years back at the Invasion Memorial in Little Havana in Miami. This picture was taken in uh, 2001 at a ceremony hosted by the 117th Wing in Birmingham. Forty years, these men were under strict orders to keep their lips sealed about their role at the Bay of Pigs. They honored that commitment. Today, only a small number of the, of the guardsmen who took part are still living. Joe Shannon was the last remaining guardsman who actually flew in combat at the Bay of Pigs, and we lost him 
at 88 years of age in January 2010. Hopefully, and the reason it was written that Wings of Denial will help keep the memory of their courage and their sacrifice alive. This is a wing group picture of the guard. It was taken during that period. Before winding up, I would be remiss not to mention a few of the excellent programs and articles recently done on the Air Guard in the Bay of Pigs since we published Wings of Denial. In 2001, Rhonda Colvin at Alabama Public TV produced a wonderful program for Alabama Stories in 2008 in, uh, entitled Bay of Pigs Reunion. It can still be viewed online or copies purchased from APTV. A number of recent really good articles have been written for the 50th anniversary. One was Dana Barley's Bahio de Co Do Cochinos a couple of weeks ago. Bob Carlton's article, Valor and Tragedy Over Bay of Pigs, appeared in the Birmingham News on Sunday. Terry Green and Al Ben have excellent articles in today's Montgomery Advertiser. Jesse Chambers, who is with us today, came and he drove down from Birmingham and became very close to Joe Shannon uh, and, and the other men who flew in it uh, and has written extensively on the uh, guard, air guard's role. He had a great piece yesterday in Birmingham Weekly that if you're interested, you might, you might want to get a copy of that. An interview Carolyn Hutchison at Troy Radio did with uh, Governor Patterson and myself on Memorial Day. It will air on Memorial Day. We, part of it aired the other day, and then the, the remainder will be on Memorial Day. Now, I'm, I know that there are a lot of others, and I apologize for any of the, anyone that I left out. Turning to the big picture, the Bay of Pigs had repercussions. A couple of obvious ones to all of us is the botched invasion led to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and put us on a path, however crooked, to the long and costly war in Vietnam. An Associated Press story on Sunday about a massive military and civilian parade in Cuba reminds us that the island remains under communist rule and still thumbs its nose at the United States and celebrates its, quote, landmark triumph over the powerful neighbor to the north. Questions about whether the Bay of Pigs was in our national interest, whether it should have been done differently or done at all, still spark lively debate. And no one has better perspective on the debate than former Governor Patterson. And we are really privileged to have him with us today and to give his insights into the Bay of Pigs operation. I'm going to leave this up if it's all right. Governor Patterson, would you? Who, who, who is that fellow on the left up there? <laughs> <laughs> and we will have answer questions or take questions after, after Governor Patterson. Uh, I'm okay. Thank you, Governor. It's a pleasure to be here today. I've seen some old friends and enjoyed talking with you a little bit. Justice Hugh Maddox and I served many years on the appellate courts of the state. Scooter Dice, raise your hand. That's one of Bear Bryant's running backs. <laughs> uh, we go way back. It's good to see you all, and it's good to be here. Uh, my wife, Tina, is with me today. Tina, would you right here? And uh, my brother's wife, uh, uh, my brother Sam, Sam's wife, Aline, Aline. <laughs> yeah, is sitting next to, uh, next to Tina there. One uh, morning I was sitting in the governor's office. I got a phone call from uh, Brigadier General Reed Doster, the commanding general of the Alabama Air Guard, who I knew and we were uh, friend, friends. He said he wanted to come down to Montgomery and see me and bring a CIA agent with him. They had something they wanted, wanted to discuss with me. They didn't want to be seen around the Capitol for some reason, and they wanted to meet me out at the governor's mansion. So we met out there. The CIA man put the proposition to me. We'd like to recruit 
personnel out of the Alabama Air National Guard to form an air arm or an air capability to support a Cuban uh, uh, invasion force, a brigade of Cubans uh, who are training now down in uh, Guatemala and getting ready to invade Cuba, but we're going to overthrow Castro and get rid of him down there. Uh, I had worked for General Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower was president then, and during World War II, I, I had worked for General Eisenhower in his headquarters in London and in Algiers, and I knew a good bit about President Eisenhower. I had great respect for him, and I asked, I remember asking this uh, CIA uh, agent, uh, does the old man know about this? Meaning Eisenhower. Oh yeah, yes sir, he sure does. He wants us to do this? Yes sir, he sure does. Well, I just accepted him at face value, and, uh, and I assumed he was telling me the truth. Uh, if I had it all to do over again, I'd have picked up the telephone and called uh, the White House and asked the president myself if he wanted us to do it. But I assumed uh, the fellow was telling me the truth, and maybe he was. But anyway, I agreed to that. Uh, they started recruiting the personnel, about a hundred of them, out of the Alabama Air Guard and Hayes Aircraft Corporation in Birmingham, and uh, moving them down to to Guatemala, where they began to put together and train uh, this uh, air arm to support this Cuban invasion. I believe there were 16 uh, B-26s had been taken out of mothball fleets, and they had flown them down there. The reason they picked the Alabama Air National Guard, I think the main reason, uh, was that they were the last unit to fly the old B-26, and they were familiar with it. Uh, and they would be the ones who would naturally train the Cubans to fly the planes. All this time this was going on, uh, I was deeply involved personally in the Kennedy-Johnson campaign. Uh, I su was supporting President, uh, then Senator Kennedy for president, and uh, had taken a, a delegation of delegates out to the Democratic National Convention in California to support his, his getting the nomination. And I was very much involved in the Kennedy-Johnson campaign. Uh, Doster would fly up occasionally home to Birmingham, and he'd stop in Montgomery and come to my office and uh, brief me on what was going on down there. And, of course, it was very hush-hush. And uh, he would regularly do this. Now, all this time that this was going on, the campaign for president was going on. And our opponent was Richard Nixon, who was vice president and being uh, on the Security Council himself, uh, would be privy to what was going on down there. And then uh, Doster came by about three weeks, maybe three weeks, four weeks, uh, before the general election in November. And this race was close, and we all knew it. And he came by and told me, he said, now any morning you're going to pick up the morning paper and the headline is going to be that we have invaded Cuba. It's going to be a great success. It can't fail. We're going to be met with the civilian population and throw flowers in the paths of our forces. Does that sound familiar to you? It really does. Yeah. But anyway, I got to thinking about this, and uh, I wondered if Senator Kennedy, my candidate for president, was aware of this. Now, the White House would brief the candidates for president periodically on what was going on, so they would know what was going on themselves. But I didn't know whether they had briefed President, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy on this or not. So I decided that I'd better tell him. And so that he could be prepared if he didn't know it, because if this thing came off on the eve of this election, and it was a close election, Nixon would claim full credit for the great success of it, and he'd have been the next president of the United States. I don't have any doubt about that. I called New York to the headquarters of the Kennedy campaign, talked to his brother-in-law, Steve Smith, 
And I said, I got to see Senator Kennedy about a very important matter. I have some information he really ought to have, if he doesn't already have it. I'll meet him anywhere. Smith said, come to uh, fly up to New York, check in the Barclay Hotel. And I did. I had a knock on the door about 10 o'clock one evening, and in comes Senator Kennedy. And the two of us sat down there by ourselves, and I told him what I've just told you. I tried to study him and read him to see if he indicated in any way that he knew about it. Uh, he didn't say he knew about it. He didn't indicate any way, in any way that he did know about it or didn't know about it. I just couldn't read him. He thanked me, got up, and left. I know now from things that have happened since that he'd been briefed on nearly about everything, but that was one thing he hadn't been briefed on. And shortly after that meeting we had, his speeches began to change a little bit, and he began to call on the uh, Eisenhower administration to do something to help the Cubans. So he did sort of alter his speeches a little bit. Well, uh, the invasion didn't come off. Kennedy was elected president, and he took office and inherited what was going on down there. Uh, it was in... Uh, Fifty years ago today, the 19th of, uh, the 19th of uh, April, uh, Kennedy, Kennedy uh, inherited this thing, didn't seem to be eager to do it, and uh, postponed the thing two or three times changed the location of the invasion to the detriment of the invasion. And then they had a meeting uh, just before the invasion took place, had a meeting in the White House in the, uh, in, in the cabinet room where all of the people on the staff involved in this, along with leaders in Congress, weighed in on their opinion about it. And as they went around the table, the question was, should we do this? And everybody there was for it, just wholeheartedly for it, except one man. That was Senator Fulbright of Arkansas. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I believe, was Wheeler. Uh, he said that this is a great thing. We should do it. It won't fail. Everybody around the table said that except Fulbright, and he got up and banged his fist on the table, I understand, and he said, no, Mr. President, uh, we should not do this. This is the kind of thing the United States ought not to get involved in, and if we do get involved in it, we won't do it well. Well, it's quite prophetic as to what, how, that, how that came true. They gathered uh, in the the, the staff gathered in the bunker under the White House. Under the White House is the uh, safe room, uh, sort of a bunker where they get out down there and run military operations. So they gathered in down there to oversee and conduct this invasion. On the, uh, on the third day of the invasion, when it began to fall apart, and it was obvious that it was not going to succeed, and the decision was made to ask for volunteers to fly one last mission on the beach to try to save the beachhead. Uh, when, that's when the Alabama boys, uh, the Alabama Air Guard from Birmingham, uh, volunteered to fly some of the planes. They had gathered down there for this occasion. When the word came that the four Alabamians uh, were not coming back, uh, Robert Kennedy is supposed to have said, well, by God, they better be dead, having in mind the Gary Powers incident, which had occurred just previously, where Gary Powers flying a spy plane, a U-2 over Russia, was shot down and captured alive. Eisenhower denied any knowledge of it or, uh, or anything about it, and then they produced powers for a show trial. You might remember that. This is what caused Kennedy to make 
such a comment. It's interesting that during this entire operation under the White House, everything that was said by everybody was recorded on tape. All that's available. So you can listen to that and hear what all of them were saying all the time they were down there. And Kennedy very definitely, very definitely said this. Well, when the four Alabamans didn't come back, and the next morning the thing was over, what was left of the brigade was captured and rounded up. Those that were dead were buried in a mass grave. Uh, then everybody disappears that has anything to do with it as far as the federal government is concerned. Uh, you found, we found out we were dealing with people who, were, who had been giving us fictitious names. All their telephones had been disconnected. They had disappeared and denied the existence of the whole thing and even contended that the four missing Alabamians were renegades and not, uh, and not employed by the United States in any, in any way. The, uh, and there was Doster uh, with uh, about a hundred Alabamians down there in, uh, in uh, Nicaragua uh, uh, stranded. Well, anyway, they got them back to Birmingham, and of course somebody had to go and see their mothers and fathers and their wives and tell them uh, that their husbands uh, would not be, not be coming back. And um, this was a very sad, uh, very sad occasion, to say, to say the least. Uh, they had been employed by a fictitious corporation called Double Check Corporation, uh, a paid, supposedly paid right well, for doing what they were going to do, insured by Lloyds of London. Well, when uh, this thing was over, uh, the families and the survivors of these people were told, if you tell about this thing, we'll cut your money off. You won't get any money. And so it was a pretty well, well kept uh, secret uh, for many, many years. Three weeks after this failed invasion, I was at the White House at a, at a bill signing ceremony. We had a bill called the Appalachian Relief Bill, I believe is what they called it. Alabama has a, nine counties that are, are in the Appalachian Mountains. That's how come we were involved. There was eight governors there for a bill signing. This was three weeks now after the, this failed invasion. Uh, Vice President uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was there. And we had lunch in a small dining room, uh, the uh, ten of us. And during the luncheon, President Kennedy said to me, he said, uh, I hope that I live long enough to be able to do something uh, to recognize what those fine men from Alabama did for their country and to be able to do that for their families. <clears throat> Of course, he never, uh, he never lived long, long enough to do anything about that. Well, anyway, this, this, t this turns out, of course, to be sort of a sad, uh, sad affair. I knew uh, these men that didn't come back there. Two of them I uh, knew very well. I'd flown one time with Riley Schamberger in a B-26 from uh, Lawson Field at Fort Benning, up to Birmingham, I just hitched a ride. This was before all of this took place. Uh, he made me ride in the Bombay. <laughs> and if you've ever ridden in the Bombay of a B-26, your, your bottom is about that high off the pavement. <laughs> That's the only time I ever rode with a, with a ride, ride of Schamburg. But he was a great guy from a prominent family up there, uh, sort of a gung-ho type of fella. Yeah. Why did, I, why did I get involved in this kind of thing? What legal authority did I have to do it? You know, that's a good question. It really is. Uh, what do you do when the president asks you to do something like this? If indeed he did ask. I, I think the first thing you do is check up to make sure he did. But what do you do? Say yes? I mean, these are things, these are lessons that you learn from these, uh, these kind of things. But you never live to put any of the lessons into... Uh, into practice because you get too old too, too fast. You, you, you know how that is. <laughs> well, anyway, the uh, president uh, did indicate that he wanted to do something to recognize these people 
that that's the only, only time I ever had any discussion with President Kennedy about what had happened down there. Uh, Seymour Hersh is a writer of some note. Uh, Seymour has written some books about the Kennedys, Dark Side of Camelot. Mr. Hersh don't like the Kennedys, and he used to kid me all the time for supporting them. He says, you don't, you don't know who you're supporting. These people ain't no good. And he would kid me about that all the time. Uh, and uh, he's, the, he's the one that got access uh, to the records in the, in the, under the White House. And he called me that day to, to tell me what, he, what Robert Kennedy had said about the Alabama, Alabama pilots. That was the source, source of that information. Shortly after this occurred, and this will be the last thing I'll say about it, shortly after this occurred, the, uh, the missile, Cuban Missile Crisis came about. And uh, I found out that, uh, and this is true, that uh, Robert Kennedy and his brother, the president, had made a deal with two mafia chieftains uh, to assassinate Castro. Traffic Canty was one of them, and the other one was from Chicago. And they were sort of hired by the Kennedys to murder Ca Castro. And they set up the headquarters in Miami and were supported by the, by the uh, Kennedy administration to do this. Uh, of course, uh, they, failed. they failed to do it. And Castro now has outlived eight presidencies, and he's still in power. And it makes you wonder if there might not be something wrong with our policy in regard to Cuba, because obviously something is wrong with our policy down there. But uh, the traffic canny and this other mobster were to be paid for their services by getting their gambling casinos back in Havana. Castro had run the mob out of Cuba when he took office. And uh, I didn't like this idea. Uh, Murder, you know, is one thing. Killing somebody in a war is another. But to plan the murder of a president of a country you're not at war with is pure and simple murder. And after that, I had very little to do uh, or didn't care much for the Kennedys after, after that. And uh, that's, that's my story. Thank you very much. <laughs> for just a few questions uh, and then uh, it will be time after the program is over, after the program concludes, you will be able to talk with Governor Patterson and Warren Trask. If you have a question, can everyone hear me? If you have a question, please raise your hand and let me give you the microphone and speak directly into the microphone so that the others in the overflow room can hear what the question is. Okay, so anyone with a question, raise your hand. Right here. Uh, governor Patterson, when you were governor, we used to refer to Alabama as the great state of Alabama. Could, could you reflect on why Alabama was such a great state then? And we don't use that term anymore, and why don't we? Well, for a country guy from uh, Tallapoosa County like me, uh, Alabama was a great place, <laughs> and particularly the state capital. Oh, yeah. I don't think we have any problem with that. Alabama is a great place, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world, really. And I think Alabama people are fine folks. They're patriotic, uh, sometimes to a fault, you know. You know why, why did we get involved in that? Why did I get involved in that thing? Young, gung-ho. Uh, I'd read some books, you know, about young soldiers of fortune going down in Central and South America and getting involved in revolutions. Yeah. And to have a part uh, in the overthrowing of a corrupt Marxist dictator down in Cuba, gosh, what a, what a tremendous thrill that, that was. I was just as gung-ho as they come. And of course, those, those pilots were too. I knew some of them personally, yeah. 
They'd get a few drinks in us, and man, we were ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Pastor, you described a scene where uh, the Kennedys hired the mafia to kill Castro. That would be a very good incentive for Castro to try to kill John Kennedy. Yeah. If I was uh, Castro, and I knew that, to be a fact, would that make me want to maybe get even before they got even with me? Yeah, I would think so. Of course, there's no proof of, proof of that. Uh, there's, no, there's no proof that, uh, that the assassination was connected to Castro in any way. It's just a few little things out on the fringes that don't, that don't fit together. I think the Warren Commission is probably right. I think that uh, Oswald was the sole assassin. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to buy that, yeah. But uh, you're right, uh, uh, Castro had ever reason <laughs> to do it himself. Mm -hmm. Governor, Patterson. Yeah. Governor Patterson, would you, uh, would you do it all over again? Everything that happened, would you do it all over again? No. No, I've learned, I've really learned some lessons out of this thing. You, if you're going to go to war, you go to war to win and win as quickly as you can. You can't do it on the cheap. You can't go to war and deny you're involved in it like we're doing in Libya right now. Yeah, Libya is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't do it again. I really wouldn't. Of course, if I was that age, <laughs> I tell you, after me and Ryan and Schellenberg, we would have done it in a minute. <laughs> I, I think about those guys uh, occasionally, and I, I liked all of them. They were great guys, and and uh, I, I enjoyed uh, their company. And uh, I, I, was it patriotic? Was it patriotism that drove these people to do this? Or was, it, was it patriotism that drove me to do that? I don't think so. I don't think that explains it all. It's that desire for adventure when you're young and impetuous and, and you want to get involved in things. Yeah. This is when you need to sit down and get, get some common sense. <laughs> yeah. When I was on the court, I went to a seminar, the Fair Trial Free Press, which was the subject. And there was a representative there, I believe from CBS, that indicated that they did have knowledge uh, prior to the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. And they wondered, had they released that at the time, it may have prevented it. What's your thought? Well, I know that, uh, that they did know about it. And Castro has, uh, has, has said that and boasted about it, uh, that they had, but the, one of the planes, part of the plan, was they had a, uh, a B-26 land at, I believe it was Miami, maybe not. It was somewhere in the Keys, somewhere in, in, in Florida. They had a plane land, and they were supposed to throw everybody off as they were land. This was a Cuban uh, pilot that was breaking away from Castro and landing his plane, but there was something about the plane that made it different from the ones that Castro had. I've forgotten the exact thing. It was whether the guns were different on it or, or something. And the newspaper people, as they always are, well, you, they're sharp-eyed. You cannot uh, keep things from the press anymore. I think that's, uh, a free press is going to—they're going to get the word. And uh, they notice that there's something wrong here. That this guy is uh, is not. You know, I mean, it's a farce. So they broke that thing real quick. Uh, I think maybe they already had advanced word. I don't know. But. The reason I ask is present day WikiLeaks. Yes, <laughs> very good. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, in Vietnam, we had all kinds of things. With, uh, I don't. I don't have any problem with that WikiLeaks thing. I, I think it's fair game. If you've got if you've got a, a corporal handling top secret stuff, then then you liable to have problems. That's true. And, and I, I, I just think it's loosely handled. Uh, I, I know during the time that I, that I was in the service, uh, I wouldn't have done what that corporal did for nothing in the world. I'd have never seen the light of day again. 
<laughs> That's true, but why do they always pick on us? That's what I want to know. Yeah, you know they, yeah. And Russia would hang them, right? They wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um...